This is theCUBE from SiliconANGLE Media. I'm Paul Gillen. The cloud is all the rage these days, but as companies move to the cloud, and some of them seeking simplicity, what they find is they actually get complexity because they want to balance their resources, they want to hedge their bets, they don't want to get locked in, so they wind up doing business with multiple cloud providers and often with an on-premise cloud as well. That creates cost complexity, and that's what cloud health technologies is addressing. Uh, my guest is Tom Axby. He's the new CEO of Cloud Health Technologies, a Boston-based company, recently raised $46 million. They have software that helps companies to understand their cloud costs and, of course, to reduce them as well. Uh, so, Tom, just a couple of weeks on the job. Welcome to theCUBE. Great, thank you, Paul. Nice to be here. Now, I'm sure you can tell better what Cloud Health does than I can, so why don't you give uh, give your description? Actually, I mean, you just did a, you did a very good setup for me. I mean, Cloud Health is the de facto standard cloud service management software. And as you quite rightly pointed out, one of the complexities now is of a multi-cloud or hybrid cloud environment. So people are making a single vendor bet. And uh, that of course is increases, as you mentioned, the complexity and the cost controls, the governance, security, even more. And that's what we do. We manage all that complexity and give our customers a single pane of glass to help manage and optimize their cloud experience. Uh, when do customers typically come to you? D are they in a crisis or are they coming to you earlier in the process to avoid that crisis? You know, it, it's all over the map. It depends on their cloud maturity. So customers we've got who are early customers who are literally born in the cloud. So you think of services such as Airbnb and Pinterest and Yelp. You know, those services are cloud-based right from the get-go. And so what they've done is experienced tremendous growth on a global basis by offering these services, managing huge data sets in the public cloud. But they also had the expertise because they were going through that right from the beginning. But as soon as that scale becomes unmanageable, as it does, and that complexity becomes greater in a multi-cloud environment, they bring us in. It's just that their technical acumen was a little bit more advanced than say someone in the enterprise who's been managing data centers and they want to migrate to the cloud, but they find that their expertise is in the data center world and their expectations are, I want the same governance and management that I had in my data center as I move to the cloud. So you're really embarking on the beginning of their cloud journey. And then sort of the third set of our customers are MSPs. So these are actually cloud service providers who are basically offering their customers and they're the trusted source for their customers all the aggregated services that are available for them and their experience. So mainly small, medium businesses and mid-market businesses will get go through the MSPs, but they're customers for us too. Talk about complexity. What are some of the unique characteristics of the cloud environment that create complexity that perhaps customers don't always anticipate? Well, the first thing is, is that the pace of innovation in the cloud is at light speed, okay? Uh, you've got these cloud vendors, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and now you've got IBM, you've got Oracle, and many other ones, Alibaba in uh, Asia Pac. And uh, they're all increasing their service offerings at a rapid pace of innovation. So just keeping up to speed with the domain expertise is very, very complex. And then when you migrate to the cloud, you're migrating services, critical business services, and just like any other environment, computing environment, whether it's distributed computing, or client server, you've got to manage those complexities so your business services and applications can run smoothly. And as you know from, you know, certainly your experience, there's an inordinate amount of moving parts, and even more so in the cloud. Now, you multiply that by a multi-cloud or a cloud or a hybrid cloud experience, and certainly being able to aggregate that data, it becomes a, a business critical task. We hear a lot about multi-cloud and customers trying to hedge their bets. Is that a, a, a major force in the industry right now? Do you see uh, companies trying actively trying to, uh, to uh, uh, diversify the number of providers that they work with? We do, yeah, absolutely. And obviously the, the larger the company and the larger their cloud spend, the more likely they are to do that. Um, so they're not reliant on one cloud provider. And also they're experiencing different paces of innovation from the cloud providers who are jockeying for that innovation right now. Um, what we're really focused on as well is the hybrid cloud. So it could be a multi-cloud environment, but it also could be their private data center they're managing, or both. So yeah, we do see a huge trend in that. When customers come to you uh, for the first time and you do an initial analysis, what are typically some of the areas where you find the greatest inefficiencies or the greatest opportunities to, to save costs? Sure, I, I think it depends again on you know where they are in their cloud journey. 
Um, they may be moving to the cloud or thinking about it. And what they want is some kind of visibility because they're so used to having tight controls and visibility and budgets within their data center because that environment is so mature to them and the cloud is like the wild west to them. They're going to get these monthly bills or they've got to commit to certain workloads or resources without really understanding what their usage patterns are going to be. So we may come in and help with the migration, capacity planning, and certainly their forecasting abilities. Uh, the more mature they are, they want to start allocating costs maybe by department or by geographic region. So they're getting more and more sophisticated in terms of their cost breakdown and their usage patterns and when those usage patterns happen. But also, as they control their costs, you know, one of the ways they can do that is to buy future visibility, if you will, into those resources or compute power from the cloud providers. And so being able to figure that out from a historical and prospective billing standpoint can be incredibly valuable to the customers. So what kinds of data do you, do you provide for that? Well, we provide you know, essentially a, a window of aggregated roll-up of any particular service that they could have. So it could be their financial data in terms of their usage information, which resource, rich resources or compute loads are working. Uh, also, as they've deployed stovepipe data vendors for performance management or configuration management, security management, all of that comes into play as well. So we can roll up that aggregated data source so they've got a single pane of glass into sort of their entire environment. And that could be at the VP level, who's running a multi-cloud environment. It could be at the financial level, where they're looking for cost controls. Or it could be at the DevOps level, where they're looking for anomalies or performance issues or bottlenecks or capacity planning. So at every level, we're trying to provide visibility into sort of the function and task um, that our customers have. Of course, cloud vendors aren't interested in having their customers be multi-cloud. They want them to be single cloud. Uh, how uh, cooperative do you find the vendors are in working with you to enable your customers to hedge their bets? Well, I mean, I think they're, they're very helpful. I mean, number one, we've, uh, we've got deep relationships with all the cloud providers because we've been doing this a long time. Um, and also what we're doing is we're hastening and accelerating our customers' movement to the cloud by offering them the same visibility and governance and tools that they had in their data or private data center world. So they actually embrace it. And they know it's going to be a multi-cloud environment, especially for the larger customers. And so, you know, absolutely, we're helping that. Uh, do you, uh, are customers uh, beginning to, to look to broker their, their experiences, their costs, to move workloads sort of flexibly between different cloud providers based perhaps on, on even short-term savings? They can do, yeah, absolutely. But again, you know, short-term savings are a trade-off between long-term savings in terms of how much capacity you're buying, and how much visibility you've got into your usage patterns as well. But certainly, I mean, uh, that's the world that we're getting into these days. I mean, Amazon does per second billing now. So uh, when you think about all that data, it's absolutely, you know, the complexity of it is absolutely, you know, mind boggling. The uh, cloud world, as Forrester pointed out in a recent, re uh, recent report, is consolidating into basically three big players and then sort of everybody else. Do you think that's a good trend for as far as customers are concerned? Um, I think, uh, you know, we've seen it over and over again. You see, you know, the dominant providers come forth and start taking over a marketplace, but there's always going to be room for other vendors. You know, IBM and Oracle certainly are not just going to lay down. Uh, people like VMware are getting into the cloud business as well. So, you know, they're the dominant ones right now, absolutely. I think what's good for the business is the trend itself of people moving all these workloads to the cloud and having more control over it so that it's actually be transparent as to who the cloud provider is. You, uh, I'm certain, had the opportunity to, to take executive positions in a number of companies. What was it about this opportunity that appealed to you? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. I mean, I've been at Ray for quite some time, especially uh, you know in the high tech world, and uh, we had a very successful run there, and we were acquired by a private equity firm, and uh, you know I was looking around at perhaps making a move, and and I'd been fascinated by the cloud and what it was doing and how transformative it was to business, and it was very akin to experiences I've had in my career selling infrastructure software. Um, you know, I was at IBM, Tivoli, for example. I was at Micromuse. Uh, and they were basically undergoing exactly the same transformation uh, in client server and distributed computing days. So I was also aware of the investors and a couple of board members of Cloud Health 
and I recalled their very first investment and it was explained to me by one of their investors this is Tivoli for the cloud and of course that resonated with me I thought that's brilliant that's so simple because you've got exactly the same complexities um, and then I tracked the company I had the opportunity to meet the founders and I saw how they had executed against their vision I saw the caliber of the team there so when an opportunity came up because the CEO and co-founder Dan Phillips was moving into the chairman role uh, as my partner now you know I jumped at it you say Tivoli to the cloud is an interesting analogy. Of course, the difference with Tivoli and cloud is that Tivoli is on-premise. You have you control the infrastructure. You have access to all the interfaces you need. Not necessarily the case with the cloud. Uh, what are some of the the difficulties that you encounter uh, with getting customers the information that they need from their cloud providers? Well, certainly the cloud. Like I said, the pace of innovation is huge. So you've really got to be up to speed with the latest offerings. And if you you know look at uh, all those APIs and how they could be changing, new services that they could be coming out with literally on a week by week basis. You've got to keep track of all of those. Then you've got to have a flexible architecture so you can actually easily integrate with those data sources and also understand the necessary workflows to present all that data in a consumable way. So it really is a, a very fast pace of innovation right now. And I think that's why you know, the, the analogy of Tivoli for the cloud uh, it was a good one because the, you were aggregating all that data, you were giving critical insight into, you know, certainly about their, their network and infrastructure and business services. So the analogy holds true, but I think you're right, the pace of innovation is much quicker. Uh, now, talk about how you, how you justify your, your cost. Uh, what, what kind of deliverables do you promise customers in exchange for what you charge them? Well, fortunately, you know, the deliverables are born out of history. We've got incredible ROIs. Um, as you know, the monthly spend as it increases, as people's cloud experience grows, okay, those costs can spiral quickly. I think that when people talk about the cost, you know, we always talk about the value. So what value are you looking for? How are you going to optimize your environment? And so the savings we can save just on their billing or utilization, and then there's the governance, and then people want to do departmental chargebacks or geo chargebacks, and we can help them with that cost allocation. So we tend to talk about value more than cost. Where do customers leave money on the table though? Where do you find some of the greatest uh, disconnects or, uh, between what they could be spending and what they really are spending? Well, it all comes down to consumption. Um, you know, if, if you could, it's like you're deciding which uh, mobile phone bill you want to get based on what your projected consumption is going to be. You know, they want to lock you into the biggest one. They're going to show you lots of different values for signing you up for a three year contract. It's the same for a cloud provider. So uh, the more you're willing to prepare, the more you can lock in your costs. And of course, as you do that, the risk is that you don't fulfill all those costs and realize those savings. On the other hand, you may be growing so exponentially quickly that uh, you're actually paying more than you would be than if you just uh, you know, basically consumed a different pricing model. In general though, do you find that customers, if they manage their co cloud costs wisely, do, uh, in, the fi in the final analysis, save money by moving to the cloud versus an on-premises architecture? Without a doubt. Um, the time to deploy services is so quick. Um, you know, the, the time to integrate different facets of your business services is so quick. You know, when you think about uh, unlimited throughput and speed and storage, on a global basis for your services, you know, it's unprecedented. And does your service cover uh, software as a service as well? We do, I mean, we're a SaaS company ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, and as you know, many SaaS companies are now providing services, <coughs> excuse me, into the cloud. And we could be, you know, collecting data from those services too. So, uh, what's the future hold then for cloud health? Where do you want to take this company? You know, I think that, you know, in the beginning I said sort of with a de facto standard for cloud service management, it's hard to claim you're really the de facto standard, especially when we're a, a private company. You know, I think what we want to do is continue to provide value, continue to innovate, um, you know, continue to have that domain expertise. And when you look across the whole governance spectrum about all these different systems, all these cloud providers, all these different data sources, it's absolutely immense. And I think that always having that single pane of glass so that people can really get the visibility they need to optimize their services you know, we're going to be a very large company just doing that. I understand you have some ambitious growth plans this year in terms of the number of employees and also uh, moving your headquarters. We do. I mean, I've only been on board for, what, two and a half weeks, and, you know, there's already been 10 people hired since I've been there, so that's the pace of hiring right now. 
I think we'll end the year at about 240 employees. So probably out from, you know, probably hired about 80 employees. And then we are moving early next year. We're moving Fort Point to downtown crossing. So uh, we've got to accommodate them all. For those of you who are not uh, f familiar with Boston, Downtown Crossing is is the center of town, and Fort Point is the the hot new area where GE is building its uh, its new That's headquarters. Right. Uh, the, uh, the in terms of of uh, how your business category develops, do you see this as uh, continuing to be a major independent category type of services you provide, or do you think cloud vendors will ultimately acquire companies like yours and offer these services on their own? Uh, I think both is going to happen. I think cloud vendors will acquire companies who do stovepipe, perhaps, you know, functionality for a certain area, but no cloud vendor is going to be able to offer the cross uh, multi-cloud or hybrid cloud experience that we do. So I think you're going to see both, but absolutely, you know, the ability to manage multi and hybrid cloud environments is key. And something I always ask our, our Boston-based uh, guests, uh, what are the advantages of being based in Boston? Well, the advantage is absolutely huge, especially in this day and age. Um, you know, Boston has got an immense talent pool coming out every single year from universities, and that talent pool now wants to stay in Boston as opposed to move to other places because, you know, the city's gone through rejuvenation. Uh, it's a vibrant city. It's an invested in city. You, you mentioned GE. There's other companies moving here. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great time to be here. You've got many success points in the high-tech arena, such as HubSpot and Wayfair and LogMeIn, publicly traded companies offering great opportunities. So I think the pace of innovation here is happening you know, at a tremendous, a, a tremendous clip. So you know, Boston's a great place to be. Glad to hear it. Welcome to town. Uh, congratulations on your growth and uh, much success to you. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. Cloud complexity simplified. I'm Paul Gillen. This is theCUBE.